Show me the money. Hey, um. Hey, um. Hey, um. hey, it's me. Knock, knock. So, uh, you got, uh, you got my money? Think of that. You're dealing with numbers all day long. Decimal points, high frequencies, bang, bang, bang. Digits. All very acidic, above the shoulders, mustard shit. Right? Kind of wake some people out. Right? You gotta feed the geese to keep the blood flowing. I keep the rhythm below the belt. I wanna stay in Arizona. I want my new contract. Show me the money! Jerry, you better yell! Show me the money! Where's my money? You gonna give me my money? Where's my money? Welcome back to Cap Strapped. I'm Max Dean, and you can follow me on Twitter at Pan Am Football. Today we are going to be talking about the DeAndre Hopkins contract with the Arizona Cardinals. It came to be uh, in an interesting way, and it is an interesting contract. So, real quick, uh, updates on the channel. I am going to probably be focusing on individual players for a little while. Uh, in terms of their contracts, because as the free agency dust settles and we kind of see where teams are um, probably after the draft, I'm going to start looking at uh, entire teams. And I have a lot of interesting ways that I want to compare teams to one another. But all of that's kind of... uh, up in the air until they finalize what their rosters are going to look like uh, and and what their salary cap situations are going to look like. So for now, we're going to just focus on a couple of of individual players. And I'll probably do Dak Prescott uh, next week. Um, I have a request for Daniil Hunter as well. So depending on how long some of these take, might even do two a week. Um, But we'll see. So... Uh, request in the comments which player you want me to focus on. Like I said, I'll do Dak for sure. Um, might look at Big Ben. Uh, but uh, yeah, so let me know who you want me to touch on. And then we'll be doing entire team breakdowns again probably after the draft. Which is only barely a month away. So it's not that far. But um, you know, it's interesting to look at from a team perspective and an individual player perspective. So that's what I'll be doing for now. And hopefully this will give you a little bit of a taste of uh, what that will look like. And I chose DeAndre Hopkins because he is a really unusual case. And I think looking at the more unusual players is is more interesting, you know. Um, I'm happy to go over players who have more standard contracts. But um, I think, you know, these guys are a little bit more... They make you think a little bit more. So... Uh, as always, all of my numbers come from OverTheCap.com and SpotTrack.com. And like, subscribe if you like what you see. This will probably be a little bit of a quicker episode today. And you know, I'm always doing these late, so those likes, uh, they always really help. And we're, we're shooting for a 1,000 subscribers for right now. Uh, let's get to it then. Okay, so the Arizona Cardinals. DeAndre Hopkins was traded for a second round pick. Uh, well, it was a little more complicated than that, but that was the basic, um, the basic compensation in the trade early in the 2020 offseason around free agency. So, um, when they brought him over, he had three years left on his contract, and he got a two-year extension. And um, so he had five years uh, of contract with the Arizona Cardinals. Now, let's look real quick at the wide receiver uh, market. Okay, basically what the market is are, you know, what these players earn annually. And so I'm going to pull up the list of top 10, which is basically the same as what you guys have been seeing for a couple other videos, but uh, I'm going to point something out here. So what you see right away is that DeAndre Hopkins is the most highly compensated wide receiver uh, in all of football, according to his extension numbers. Um, Now, 
when we were looking at this, there's something that, that kind of jumps out at you uh, if you know what you're looking at. And that is, why is it that Julio Jones, who is the second most highly compensated player at his position, why is there only a 26.1% raise over the 10th most highly compensated player at his position. So there's only a 26.1% raise over Robert Woods at number 10. Now I say only, but that's pr pretty standard. I think that's that's a pretty normal number. That's the kind of number that you would see basically from the most highly compensated player to the 10th most highly compensated player. Obviously, the percentage varies from position to position, but that's not unusual. But what is unusual is that why, if it's only 26.1%, is there a 19.3% raise from Julio Jones to DeAndre Hopkins? Why is it that it's almost as big of a raise from the number two to number one uh, as it is from the number 10 to the number two? And the answer to that, as some of you probably know just off the top of your head, and some of you may not, is that it's because you take the average per year uh, from the extension numbers. So if a player had, you know, $4 million, uh, he was due $4 million uh, in the final year of his contract, and then he signed a four-year extension uh, worth $20 million, you basically, when it comes to this type of reporting of numbers, you basically ignore that last year remaining from the old contract and you look at the new money and the new years from the contract. So those those four years for $20 million total means he has a four-year contract worth $5 million per year. So most of these other players have had extensions with around one year left on their contract. Some of them signed as free agents. Um, I think maybe just, I think probably just Amari Cooper did. But, so the rest were all extensions, but most of them were with one year remaining. I think possibly some with two. I didn't look that closely, but that's the norm. Now, what's different about DeAndre Hopkins? This is DeAndre Hopkins' contract uh, with the Arizona Cardinals. When he was traded, he still had 2020, 2021, and 2022 remaining uh, under contract when he signed his extension. That's really unusual. Those three years remaining before a contract extension is signed, that is, uh, it's, not, it's not that you never see it, but it, you don't see it often because it just doesn't make sense for a team to do it. Um, you know, an extension before a player's contract has expired, it makes a lot of sense for a few reasons. One, because you are the only team that's able to negotiate with that player, so it limits the other offers that you would be comparing uh, your offer to, to nil, so it's all you. Um, players often want to get contracts done and get their guarantees, so they might be willing to accept a little bit lower than what they would get on the open market, so there's that. And then Secondly, you can space out the average per year a little bit more um, because even though the numbers are reported as, say, for example, a four-year $20 million contract, it's actually a five-year $24 million contract based on the example I had given you earlier. And so while in that particular one it might not make that much of a difference, if you're making a huge jump from a player who's on a rookie contract to a very highly compensated player, you can uh, spread that money out a little bit more evenly throughout those years, have a little bit of a lower cap percentage taken up. So, you know, that makes a lot of sense. However, why would you do it with so many years left under contract? It's hard to say, uh, like, why it really seemed that appealing to them. Uh, I think ultimately what it came down to for them was just making him happy. Um, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. But 
if you have a player under contract for three years, there's just there's no need to negotiate. There's no need to to give more guarantees. There's no need to give this and that and the other. And, and you know, when they entered this negotiation, it turned into you know him asking for more and more and more. I think and because they started the process they just they kept rolling with it and rolling with it because ultimately this is an incredibly player friendly contract and i'm going to show you why here um so first of all you know he had uh, a signing bonus which was prorated throughout the the length of the contract when he signed his extension so that would be 2020 all the way through 2024 um, for an average of 5.5 million per year in just in that signing bonus and then this year in 2021 he has an option bonus which I'm not sure is technically taken effect yet but this is what it's going to look like when it does so that's why there's an additional uh, 2.25 in proration for the final four years so what you're really looking at there is 5.5 per year from the signing bonus over all five years and then an additional 2.25 per year from the option bonus over the final four years and an option bonus uh, we talk about it in uh, in our um, how the NFL salary cap works video but just as a reiteration it's exactly the same as a signing bonus except that it doesn't take effect when you sign the contract it takes effect at some point when you write it in in a later year and it's basically just a proration tool uh, it's like a roster bonus Except that a roster bonus, it all affects the, the single year, whereas an option bonus prorates out over the, um, you know, the re remainder of the contract. Um, he has guarantees uh, for his base salary for 2020, 2021, and um, full guarantees, that is, in uh, 2021. And then he had... A, a, Injury guarantee for 2022, which became fully guaranteed or will become fully guaranteed in a couple of days here. So if you're looking at the potential dead money, it's very, very high. It would be really unrealistic for them to even try and get out of the contract until after the 2022 season if things went way sideways. So they're basically locked in for three years. Um, three years is not super abnormal for a big time player like this but you know two two to three players or two to three years is is really generally what you look at for free agent contracts now why did they feel comfortable giving him this contract because yeah it would have made him happy it made him happy but do you have to do that no there's a lot of players who would love extensions three years out and teams don't do it just to make the player happy but here's why so when they got DeAndre Hopkins. There were a couple of ways that the team probably looked at this. So, even though his extension report is two years, twenty-seven point two five million per year, there are a couple of other kind of snapshots of average per year that we can look at. When he was traded for, it was three years, and basically the average per year was thirteen point three oh five million. Now, if you remember, that's below even the top ten most compensated player, uh, who was Robert Woods at I believe sixteen point two five million per year. Now, this is not actually what he was making on an average per year because. Again, when you trade a player, his prorated bonus does not go with him. That all stays with his old team. So that stayed with the Houston Texans. Only the as-of-yet unpaid money traveled with him to the Cardinals. So even though his average per year for the contract, his old contract was a little higher, what it what it actually looked like and, and appear and, you know, effectively was for the Cardinals was 13.305 million per year. So basically they traded for a wide receiver who had a contract for of three years, 13.305 million per year, you know, effectively for them. 
So they looked at that and they said, you know, that's that's super low. That's super low. So let's get some more years of control for to raise and and give back by raising his salary a little bit because you know we already only got him for a second round pick so that's already great value so we can raise his salary a little bit and extend our control because he's a young player right in his prime so when they gave him the extension it looks like this two years 27.25 million per year Uh, and that's what's reported and the reason that they did this like this is because this means a lot to DeAndre Hopkins. He gets to go out and it, it gets put on ESPN, NFL Network, blasted all over Twitter, uh, you know, on the news and on the news in Arizona, probably even in other, you know, nightly news sports moments, people will talk about this number. And it is, again, it's almost 20% higher than the highest paid wide receiver, which is Julio Jones. Um, and so... They added two years so that it could be a nice high number, but realistically, and it was negotiated based on this, this, right? So, so, you know, if you hear people say like, no, this is, this is what his extension number is. Yes, it is. It was negotiated based on this. However, from a team planning perspective, they were able to justify that because of this number right here. When you combine the previous years and the extension year or the two extension years you get five years valued at a little over uh, a little under 19 million per year so 18.883 million per year so that is a five-year contract now for 18.883 million per year now it could be a little bit more cloudy than that if it was an extension with his old team because there's still There's still, you know, uh, prorated money all all tied up in that. But because it's a very fresh uh, start with the new team, no previously prorated money or anything like that, um, they basically said it's kind like for them in house with salary cap planning, they justified it by saying basically we could we could pretend that we traded a second round pick for a player who was franchise tagged and signed him to a five-year contract worth 18.883 million per year. So from DeAndre Hopkins perspective, he gets 27.25 million per year to report out. From their perspective, they get a player for 18.883 million per year. So this is something that I really like on both ends because it's creative thinking from the wide receiver, from the player. So they get to, uh, you know, um, boost their brand, get their name out there more, uh, you know, get that top of the market money. And because it's so much higher than the highest paid wide receiver, this is probably not going to get touched for a few years. Other teams around the league when they're signing their players to extensions, like the the, the, the more n- uh, normal way, which is with a year left, they're going to look at this as an outlier. I mean, like, you, you never truly know. Sometimes sometimes a, a desperate team will, uh, you know, cave into things like this. Like a player might say, well, look, well, DeAndre Hopkins got this. I should be getting close to this. I'm a better player. In, in my opinion, it's pretty unlikely that a team would actually do that. Because it's going to be looked at as an outlier extension number uh, because it was done the way it was. So he's going to maintain that highest paid wide receiver in the league for a few years. Which often won't happen because the way that you know these, these contracts work and the market works is they're always outdoing each other. Uh, at least a couple of years later, somebody is overtaking for the most the highest paid as the cap increases but that's not going to happen with DeAndre Hopkins and it's smart from a team perspective uh, because you can sign the player to a contract that makes him happy that gives him that super high number Um, but you know ultimately what are you getting you're getting a player for 18.883 million for five years and so let's see where that stacks up now
So that actually makes him the f fourth highest, no, fifth highest compensated player in terms of the actual market. So he would be below Julio Jones, Keenan Allen, Amari Cooper, Michael Thomas. Um, so that that puts uh, and yeah, yeah, Michael Thomas. So that puts him at the one, two, three, four, f fifth highest paid player at the position, where. When you're looking at it at this chart, it looks like he's far and away the highest compensated. So that's really interesting. However, there are some other factors to look at here as well. So while I really like the creative thinking on both sides to get this done, there's something to take note of here. The fact that they did this for DeAndre Hopkins in my mind, would would basically push me to say, again, I'm not a GM, I'm not a contract negotiator, but looking at what players get, there's give and take. And it kind of seems like this turned into more give on the part of the Arizona Cardinals and more take on the side of DeAndre Hopkins, which I'm all for as far as players concerned. I don't see anything wrong with him trying to get maximum value. However, on the other side, you need to be careful here because they have uh, also given him a no-trade clause. They have given him a no-franchise tag clause. And they've written into the contract an ability for him to void the contract after four years if he meets certain incentives. So the no-trade clause, that's big because... Um, if uh, if they want to move on from him, you know, if if any other you know regime comes in in Arizona and they want to change things up, they can't trade him unless he gives the okay. Uh, they can't franchise tag him, so he's going to be 32 or 33 at the end of this contract. And if he's still playing very well, um, you know, you can't uh, you can't put the franchise tag on him. You have to negotiate a new contract. That's very player friendly. There are not many players who get a no franchise tag contra uh, clause, and so you know you're already giving him this raise three years out. I would have said no way we're giving you the no franchise tag, okay? And then on top of that, there's the uh, ability to void if these certain parameters are met. What are those parameters? Let's look at them right here. He has a few possibilities. So he has to hit one and only one of these four qualifiers he would have to be an all pro all four years from 2020 through 2023 because the void would take place after the 2023 year so that that's the allotted time for him to achieve this that that he didn't do this year so he already can't achieve that one that's a pretty tough one to do to be honest not that uh, you know any of these are not tough but for him that would probably be the hardest um, then he would have to have at least 400 receptions. Um, currently he has 115 after just the 2020 season. So he's on pace for that. It is hard to average a hundred receptions a year for four straight years. Um, you know, but he, he is the type of receiver who, is more likely to do that like he just catches everything he's he's always open even in contested situations so he does catch a lot of footballs and he's quickly turned into Kyler Murray's favorite weapon so you know um he's on pace to do that to break that one so that would be one way he could do it and uh, or he could get 5,000 receiving yards over that four years so he would have to average uh, 1,250 yards per year uh, for the five years and so he's on pace with that as well after achieving 1407 yards or he would have to get 40 touchdowns uh, over those four years so averaging 10 per year and he only had six this year so he he could achieve that one still he's just not on pace to do it um, so you know he would have to average what 14 over he would have to have 34 more over the next three years. So basically, he would have to average 
around 12 touchdowns per year for the next three years. So that's pretty tough. But, you know, he's, he's on pace for two out of the four right now. Um, now, this is very difficult to achieve. Um, any substantial injury would basically totally remove the possibility of this. However, if he were to achieve it, let's see what that would turn the contract into. A four-year contract worth $19.875 million per year. So that would put him back up, um, I believe, third. But it would also preclude them from using the franchise tag. And it would force him, uh, force them to give him another extension after basically only three years. So what it does is, like, if you look at it this way, from 2020 through 20, 2020, 2021, 2022, let's say he's sitting there and he is still on pace for one or two of these. They cannot really afford to have him just go into the 2020 he, okay let me let me back up just a little bit he's on pace for two out of four right now let's say two more years go by and he's still on pace for uh, that that means he's you know being very productive and so he's still a very valuable player they cannot afford to have him play the 2023 season, achieve this qualifier, and just void his contract because then he's a free agent. They can't use the franchise tag on him, so uh, you know they, they can't do anything. So they they lose him for nothing, and then he's going to be able to negotiate with any other team that that he wants to. They could risk it and try and get uh, if he and then if he achieves the qualifier, try and do an extension, you know, basically between the Super Bowl and when free agency starts, but knowing DeAndre Hopkins and how hard of a negotiator he is, he probably is not going to go for that. So if he's on pace to break the qualifier after three years, he is going to probably get another extension after only three years, which is going to be another substantial amount of guaranteed money. So... To kind of sum it up, this is a really interesting contract because it was signed three years out. Um, I like the creative thinking on both sides. I get my really high number uh, reported. And then for the team, they're like, well, because it's so far out and we have so little invested, we can get a player for a really good value while making you know it seem like it's a super high number. That should have been enough, uh, you know, to get this deal done. If if you really couldn't get it done without the f- no franchise tag clause, I would have just let him play for a year. I mean, he has three years left. Like, you hold all the cards. You traded a second-round pick for him, yeah, but, like, you just traded a second-round pick. It's not like you traded two first-round picks and, you know... If he sits out during training camp, it's a, it's embarrassing for you. I mean, on top of that, the new CBA was just signed, making that all harder. So I just don't understand why, when they did something to help him out, they they you know got a little kind of backdoor bonus for them. Why give him the the no franchise tag clause? Why give him the no trade tag no trade clause? Why why give him this void possibility? that could potentially make him a free agent after only four years, meaning you're going to be back at the negotiating table in, you know, three years from when you signed this extension. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, there are, there are things I like and dislike from the Cardinals perspective. And honestly, from DeAndre Hopkins uh, perspective, I like everything. This is an incredible contract. So, uh, if you guys have any questions about it, let me know. But that's been cap strap for this week. Um, you know, and check back uh, next week to see what player we're going to be going over. And uh, and I'll say it's probably going to be Dak Prescott. But but request if you guys hit me up with a player, where I'm like, oh yeah, that's one that I've really been wanting to do. And somebody requests it, I might do it. So uh, yeah, 
Uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much, guys. Again, you can find me on Twitter at Pan Am Football, and I will see you all next week.